we are helping to generate here at the Natural Hazards Center. And it's part of this much broader initiative funded by the NSF to build up our natural hazards engineering research capability in this nation so that we can confront, confront the major natural hazards challenges that we are facing. And so there are three big things that we are working to do through this new Converge facility. So one is to link the long-standing social science, engineering, and emerging interdisciplinary research communities to develop and share best practices for the ethical conduct of research. How many of you in here have partnered with universities or academic researchers in the work that you do? How many of you have had requests from academic researchers who would like to partner with you? Okay. okay. Then the third thing we're working to do is to enhance and promote this research. So what is convergence? Briefly, convergence is, uh, has been really promoted by our National Academies of Sciences, as well as the National Science Foundation as one of their 10 big ideas that they're hoping to move forward in the scientific community in this nation. And so convergence research is oftentimes driven by a specific and compelling problem, like rising disaster losses. And it actually requires, by its very definition, that people with diverse perspectives, knowledge, expertise, come together and bring that knowledge together in order to achieve scientific breakthroughs that otherwise would not be possible. And so what Converge is really one part of what we're going to be doing. The National Science Foundation has really invested in attempting to get different research communities who oftentimes respond to disaster to try to understand the immediate as well as longer term effects, has invested in bringing together the geotechnical engineering community, the structural engineering community, the nearshore community, as well as the social science communities. And so what Converge in part is about is bringing those communities together as well as linking them to various technical and cyber infrastructure resources that are, to, that are available. And so that's words on a page about what our vision is, what we're gonna be doing. I think that telling you a story to help explain why we're doing what we're doing may be most helpful. So a couple of months ago in September of 2018, the Indonesian island of Sulawesi was absolutely devastated in an earthquake, subsequent tsunami, and a variety of landslide activity on that island. Soon after this disaster occurred, Nature ran this fascinating article about what was happening on the ground in Indonesia. How many of you in here have ever been to Indonesia? Ah, quite a few of you. So several of, um, Several things happened after this event that oftentimes happen after disasters. Researchers from around the world, including engineers, geotechnical experts, seismologists, attempted to get to Indonesia so they could understand and characterize what happened in this major event. But what Nature reported was that uh, engineers and scientists from the US, from Japan, and from a variety of other countries were literally trapped outside of the borders of Indonesia as they were trying to get in. Indonesia, for a very long time, has required, if you're gonna do research in Indonesia, they have an application system where you must submit your research protocols and you must receive a research visa before you are allowed to conduct research there. Brazil has a similar requirement for research in their nation. So this isn't necessarily uncommon for a nation to require a research visa. But what was interesting is the Indonesian government, they stepped up and they said, we understand why these scientists and engineers want to get in, into this area that's affected. We understand the value of rapid reconnaissance research, but we also need you to understand that we have protocols in place for a reason to try to understand when research is gonna occur and where it's gonna occur, and we also need to gently remind you. 
Should you be caught in Indonesia conducting research without one of the required visas, you may be imprisoned for two years. Post-disaster research of this na nature has been going on for decades, for at least seven decades in this, in this nation and in nations beyond. And I think that Indonesian story, it gets at both the incredible possible contributions that researchers may make as well as the challenges. And so in terms of contributions, modern building codes and standards in part are a direct consequence of those damage assessments that engineers do when they go out immediately after a disaster and attempt to inspect buildings to understand how they performed. I am so thankful for that work they do because our lives are safer because of it. Similarly, on the social science side, lessons that social scientists have learned about human vulnerability, about how organizations function or don't function in the face of a disaster, has had a profound influence on emergency management practice. Now, on the other hand, increasingly, researchers have been writing about a lot of questions like, but who gets to set that post-disaster research agenda and who benefits from that research that's happening? Also, uh, increasingly, people have been writing a lot about various methodological and ethical critiques of disaster research as we're seeing more and more disasters and more and more studies. So things like that this field in some ways has been skewed or biased towards large scale events, oftentimes overlooking the smaller scale nuisance, repetitive loss sorts of disasters that may affect smaller communities. Also, some critiques around lack of identification and coordination of researchers, that researchers can actually create some kind of potential additional burden on affected communities as researchers arrive. Some critiques around what happens when external researchers who have the capacity to write grants, get funding, and then go to the disaster zone, do local researchers get overwhelmed, inundated, and otherwise overlooked? Uh, questions about when we focus on that kind of rapid data collection, it doesn't leave us a lot of time to maybe understand local cultures, norms, policies, and practices and also that there may be some problems with duplication, that people are going to the same place, they're asking the same people the same questions. And while replication is valuable in science, duplication oftentimes is not desirable. And so as the team at the Natural Hazard Center, as we read these critiques and started to think more deeply about them, we recognized that there were these increasing calls to change the landscape that even though disaster research has contributed so much over the years, that there's also a possibility perhaps for us to do even more ethically informed and rigorous research. But one of the things we recognize is if you wanna change the landscape, you first have to understand the lay of the landscape. And we were left with a number of questions, some of them that may sound relatively straightforward, but heretofore had gone unanswered. And so one question that we and others had was how many social science hazards and disaster researchers are there out there anyway? So people sometimes wanna partner with social scientists, they wanna understand what it is that we know or vice versa, social scientists wanna partner with practitioners, but then where are these social scientists? And this question about how many social scientists there are had actually been raised in 2006 in this foundational National Academies report where they dedicated a whole chapter to the state of the hazards and disaster research workforce. And here's what they wrote in part. They said, the size and composition of the hazards and disaster workforce will significantly determine the extent to which the social sciences in general is going to be able to meet 21st century challenges, especially as related to rising disaster losses. But then they went on to write, the committee that wrote this report does not have a precise accounting of the numbers of social scientists from respective disciplines who are currently engaged in hazards and disaster research. And neither government agencies nor professional associations are currently collecting this information. 
So we also wanted to know, so if we know how many researchers are out there, then we wanted to know where are they located. We also wanted to understand, because the social sciences are obviously vast and, and uh, a large area of study, so what disciplines are actually represented and what's their levels of expertise so that when partnership requests are received, who's the right match? We also wanted to know, what do these researchers study? What disasters have they studied? Did they do preparedness, response, recovery? And then we also wanted to understand the demographic composition of the workforce. Because another thing that this National Academies report really said is that we know that oftentimes the research community is not reflective of the people who we are studying and the people we are serving. And so one of the things that they said is if we're gonna meet these 21st century challenges, we also must make sure that we are in, enabling a diverse next generation of leaders and researchers to take on this task at hand. And so here's Jeff again wearing a different outfit because <laughs> this is a different day when he so kindly and generously visited us at the Natural Hazard Center again. And so Jeff, as usual, listen to us as we were bouncing all of these questions and talking to him about what we were hoping to achieve with this new work. And Jeff patiently listened as we did what academics do, which we talk and talk and talk and talk. Jeff listened, and then he goes, I get it. He said, you're trying to do a census and then to create a phone book. And we said, yes, that's it. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out who are these social scientists, where are they, and we ultimately, once we have that information, then we want to try to connect them together so we can amplify this work. And so Jeff put it like that, but because I'm an academic, I'm gonna put a bunch more words on the screen. And so this is what we're trying to do. And so SCR, with this is the social science extreme events research network that we've been working on building over this past year. And so SCR, its mission is to do the following. This is, the, this is the phone book and the census. And so we want to identify and connect social science researchers first to one another, but then we also want to connect them to interdisciplinary teams, to communities at risk, and also to those who have been affected by hazards and disasters who see these emergent social, political, and economic problems that always come about as a very effect of disasters. And then we also want to figure out how can we amplify and advance this work? Because the fact of the matter is we are living in a world today where somewhere around the world, a disaster occurs every single day. And almost every accounting of what's happening with disaster losses is that that is on the rise. And so if we need to think about the future that we are confronting in terms of rising hazards and disaster losses, how are we also going to respond in kind as researchers and make sure that our research does count? Okay. So in July of 2018, we opened up a form. And on that form, it was accompanied by an invitation, a call to social scientists inviting them to join this new network. And so in response to our first question, how many social scientists are there? As of October 30th, which we paused on October 30th because the team had to start cleaning the data. And so as of October 30th, 618 social scientists have joined SCIR. Now, with the important caveat, not only is this of as October 30th, 2018, we also know this is not yet a complete census. Just like in our United States, we are mandated under our constitution every 10 years, we are to conduct a complete census of the entire US. We know this isn't yet a complete census of the entire research community, but this is a start. Next question, where are those researchers located? And this is an important question because while a disaster occurs somewhere around the world every single day, we know that certain regions are more at risk currently and into the future and are more affected by these extreme events. 
And so as of right now, again, not a complete census, but by the UN regions, this is where those social scientists who have signed up for the database so far are located. Now, everyone in this room, you are experts in this space. Pause and think for a minute about where do the most severe and most frequent disaster losses occur around the world. United Nations report after United Nations report continues to show China, Latin America, Africa are the places, the continents where we continue to see the most profound disaster losses, disproportionate losses. And again, this isn't a complete census yet, but this should raise questions for us, right, about where, where is the research capacity, where are the disasters happening, and how might we partner across place? In partnership with ESRI, the Natural Hazard Center team has been working on building out this map to, in order to show the location of the social science researchers. And so right now, with this version 1.0 of the map, and we're looking forward to learning from all of you and getting feedback on this, right now you can search by UN region for the SCR researchers. You can also go into any of the 24 United Nations sub-regions and search for researchers there. And you can go into the map and search by nation. So of the social scientists who have signed up for the SCR platform so far, 443 of them are located in these United States. And so you can go in and search for researchers in the US. Third big question we were trying to answer, what disciplines do these social scientists uh, represent and what is their topical and methodological expertise? So this is where the form that we ask everyone to fill out has been helpful. And so some of the things we can see is that disaster science as well as sociology, geography, public administration are some of the most common social science disciplines that have been represented, but you can see there are a range of different disciplines um, in, uh, included in the database. In addition, we collected information on primary professional status, and while the majority of researchers who've signed up for this database so far are academic researchers or are at present students, we're also trying to make sure and involve and include private sector, nonprofit, government, as well as independent researchers in this process. Also, one of the things that we asked the researchers about was about their methodological or technical expertise that they bring to bear when conducting studies on the human impacts of disaster. And so the people filling out this survey could click any method that they typically use. And so again, when thinking about partnerships with social scientists, are you looking for somebody that can do in-depth interviews, surveys, can maybe partner with you, with your expertise, with GIS analysis, and so forth? And so a range of methodological expertise represented. And also, we ask researchers themselves to share with us the top five to seven keywords that help characterize the work that they do. And so one of the things that a lot of my work, Jennifer Tobin's work at the center, we focus a lot on children and schools in disaster. Right now with the Alaska earthquake unfolding, schools across Anchorage, school districts are closed all this week and largely due to non-structural damage in a number of those schools. And so one of the things that we could use this database for, so I got a call yesterday asking about the state of the schools in Alaska. And so we can get in this database and we can search for anybody that said, schools are my expertise. And that's where, again, we're hoping to mobilize and connect researchers with real world problems that communities are facing. This is an example of how you can go into the SCR map and actually search for not only a researcher by location, but also by that type of expertise. Okay, now some of the things that Mason Matthews and Halrey Wu, who are the postdocs at the Hazard Center who've been working on this, they've been saying, it's great, we gotta get a lay of the landscape first, so we have to have the lists of the researchers, we have to have the geographic information, but then how might we use this for research purposes. So three brief examples. 
One is we want to think about how can we use this information real time. And so when Hurricane Florence or Hurricane Michael were making their way to the eastern shores of our United States, one of the things we can do real time is overlay this with current weather so we could see not only who are the researchers in the direct path of the storm, but then again, depending on potential storm or disaster effects, can search elsewhere for people who have expertise that may be able to be brought to bear on the disaster at hand. We've also played some in partnership with Esri with overlaying different forms of hazards risk. So we could look at the SCR researchers in proximity to different hazards types that our nation, communities, states confront. And then also we've been working with the Centers for Disease Control and specifically with their social vulnerability indices and have been overlaying and saying, where are the vulnerability hotspots? Where are the most vulnerable people in our nation and where are the researchers and especially the researchers with expertise in social vulnerability to disasters in relation to the vulnerable populations in our country? Next big question that we were trying to answer was related to what the researchers study and when they study it. And you can see from the SCR survey, this is the range of disaster studies that the respondents said that they examine in their own work. We also ask about what types of disasters the respondents to the SCR study survey, and perhaps again, not surprisingly, because of our networks with this first version of the survey and the map, the vast majority of respondents said that they study natural hazards, but other people who've signed up for this database also hold expertise in technological as well as terrorist incidents. We also ask about most common disaster events studied and people could enter in up to 10 disasters that they've actually studied. And we have hundreds and hundreds of different disasters and disaster types that the researchers said they'd studied. But interestingly, the five most common that researchers who've reported so far said they've been engaged in studying are Hurricane Katrina, Harvey, Sandy, Irma, and Maria. The future is now in terms of what we're looking at with the changing face of disasters and disaster research with these bigger events. Okay. Finally, we wanted to understand something about the demographic composition of our hazards and disaster research for workforce. And so here are some of the things that we learned. Of the professional researchers who signed up for this, the majority hold a terminal doctoral degree. The remainder have bachelor's, master's, or associate degrees. We also interestingly found that the people who've signed up for this database so far are actually not completely racially reflective of the demographic of our nation, let alone of our world. But so far, the respondents to this survey um, have been about 63% non-Hispanic white, with the remainder coming from Asian, Asian American backgrounds, Black, Hispanic, Latino, and you can see the other groups we ask about. Also, at present, our database includes a f uh, more females than males. And also, we have researchers from the age of 23 to 78 who signed up, average age of, all, of 41, and the average length of experience in this field is, related, is about 10 years. And why we ask about this is because one of the things, one of the many things that I love about the hazards research community is there has been a real investment in trying to bring along next generation researchers and to make sure that they have an opportunity to come into the field and to have an opportunity to be a part of new field investigation. So it's not just the more senior researchers who get that chance. And so we ask researchers to self-identify as, do you see yourself as a core researcher? So somebody who's dedicated your professional career and life to doing this work? Are you a periodic researcher who sometimes sort of dabbles in hazards and disaster research, but it's not your main area of focus? We also had about 6% who said they're situational researchers, that they only do this work because their communities were struck low by disaster. And then about one fifth of the researchers identified as emerging. So they're students or they're new to the field and they're trying to get a foothold in this area of study. Okay. So in closing today, 
So just some words to you on this is where we're at and thank you for allowing us to share what we've been doing so far with this and hopefully again we'll be able to learn from you over coming days. But some of the things that we're going to work to continue to do is to keep that database to continue to build the database out and also to continue to update the map so they are most useful. We want to ultimately try to democratize the research and engagement process. We are doing this work in part not just so we can have a list of, where, of who the researchers are and where they are. We also want to make sure that when something happens, who do you call? You oftentimes call the people that you know and the people that you've had experience with. But sometimes the people that you know and you have experience with, something that we know about that is that it can actually be this really limited network, right? And certain people who are in the network, they get a call a lot, but people who aren't in the network that may still hold expertise may not always get the call. And so we hope by literally putting researchers on a map that we may open up this possibility to democratize the research and engagement process. Also, we're hoping that through identifying the social science community, then we're gonna be able to work more effectively with engineering communities, interdisciplinary communities, but also with local, state, federal, and tribal government. Also, overall, one of the projects with this, because we know oftentimes what draws disaster researchers into the field is that a big event happens. And so we, there's also an education and training mission that's affiliated with the Converge facility that's about trying to ensure that researchers new to this field are conducting ethical and rigorous research. Also, one of the things that we're trying to do with this is to increase the visibility and the positive impact of the social science community. And so we can better articulate what it is that we know, what it is we've learned over these decades of doing this research and partner better together to amplify the power of this work. And then finally, we wanna make sure as we move through this, with every fresh disaster comes new questions, new opportunities, and new desires to learn. But one of the things that we are hoping for is that the questions, the research that we do will be grounded in an agenda that is about justice, that's about equity, and is ultimately about reducing the harm and suffering from these events. And with that, I will end where I began with gratitude for all of you. Thank you for listening and for having me with you today. Thank you. Uh, Justin Cates with Nashua Office of Emergency Management in New Hampshire. Uh, there's been a lot of work by emergency managers uh, on business reentry during a disaster. Have you thought about looking at any of those models at how you might credential researchers to get back into these disaster stricken areas to actually go through and partner with emergency managers to give them access and all the things that go along with it. That, that is a great question and I would love to talk to you more about that. One of the things that we're doing over the next five years with the, in part in partnership with the CDC is we're developing a series of training modules for disaster researchers, including on methods, partnerships, and so forth. And so I would, I would love, are you here for the next two days? So I have to go teach the undergrads this afternoon, but I'll be back. And so I would love to talk to you more about that and about those possibilities. I know that engineers have really, they have in particular moved forward in the, those sorts of ways in terms of doing damage inspections. But I think that would be a really interesting question for the social scientists, especially those who are looking for those kinds of partnerships. So I would love to talk to you more about it. Thank you. Any other questions for, uh, we have one question up here. Dan? Hi, this is Daniel Stelb from Oregon Office of Emergency Management. Um, so you're creating a cadre, basically uh, an online database for all of these researchers. What sort of interactions have you guys had with the Emergency Management Assistance Compact and building that cadre to interface with that system? Uh, that is a good question and so far no direct interface in that kind of way and so I hope we could talk more about that. Last um, uh, spring I was at a meeting with Jeff where we were meeting with some 
emergency managers from larger cities and started to talk about that, about how we could better coordinate and communicate with local, state, and federal government. And so we've started to have some of those conversations, but no formal relationship with, or um, with the sort of compact that you're referring to. So I would love to talk to you more if that's possible. Thank you. <coughs> Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. P. Thank you.